Today is a big day, party people. Woo! Brand new motor, baby! Woo! Welcome back to the $500 tow rig project. I scored this truck for just 500 bucks on Facebook Marketplace, but it had major engine damage. So in the previous episodes, we pulled out the destroyed F-150 engine. We managed to acquire and fully rebuild a Lincoln Navigator engine, which is gonna gain us over 40 more horsepower. And now we're dropping that brand new engine back in the truck, doing all the little things to get it running again. What you're about to see took place over many weeks and many, many hours of work, but we're officially gonna have a running and driving tow rig by the end of this episode. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. There's so much for us to do, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Now let's make it go higher. Got like 600 pounds floating in the air. I'm gonna lift the hood even more. Voila. So now we can lower it a little bit. Oh, comes down so fast. Oh, knocked down my hood strut. Now we should be able to lower it and the crank pulley will clear that front cross member. We need to go a little bit lower and then we gotta go back further. We're still like two feet away from the motor mount bracket. All right, I need to go up a little bit because the oil pan is resting on that cross member. So you need to come up and then back and then down. Okay, so I think our next step is a little bit lower, back, a little bit lower, back, and we'll just kind of shimmy it in. Certainly not very graceful, but our flex plate is now touching the flywheel. So we're getting really, really close, actually. Basically, what I need to do is probably pull that ratchet strap a little bit tighter so the engine comes this way, and then we should almost be able to just like drop it right in. But I gotta be really careful because I really don't wanna damage the torque converter or you know, any of those components back there. Oh my gosh, I just went to go crank it. I was like, wait a second, it's loose. The ratchet strap broke. So did it break? Oh yeah, I bet it just sawed itself apart right there. It just kind of rubbed against the front cover. And you know, that, that actually is the portion of the block. Yeah, it just ripped itself apart. So, I wonder if I could try to put the hook in here instead, because we're gonna need that. I need to pull it forward some. Got a new ratchet strap rigged up and it is pretty much dialed in. So we just need to go down a bit, back, and then hopefully we'll just drop right in. Woo! That is not what I intended. Don't know what we're resting on, but everything came crashing down. <laughs> oh man, gotta try that again. Is that in? Oh yeah, that's almost lined up. All I did was barely push it with my hand. So I've been fighting it for a while with no real progress, but I remembered that when I took it out, I had to jack up the transmission like pretty high to kind of break everything loose. And so I just went ahead and set the jack under there. Hopefully when I push the transmission up a little bit, it'll give me enough to get that flex plate sort of more in the bell housing. Um, and then perhaps I can line up the motor mounts because I'm still just struggling. So jacking up the transmission actually helped. I was able to come in from right here with the little pry bar and push it. And it's a little bit hard to see, but the, the uh, flex plate is now inside of the bell housing, which should mean that we can get it a little bit closer now. I wanna be careful not to damage those bolt threads uh, sticking off the torque converter, because that would be terrible. But this engine mount is a whole lot closer now. I wonder if I can lower it and maybe get a bit closer. Oh wow, this side is way off since I got the pressure plate in the, or the flex plate here in the bell housing. But I think I'm gonna rock with it because the other motor mount has been the one giving me trouble. And if I can get that one in, this one should also go in. It is not easy to lower it elegantly. That is for sure. Oh, is that in? I managed to just push it in. Oh, nope. I knew this would be tough, but I didn't think it would be this tough if I'm honest. Putting the E46 engine back in is like <laughs> not even a third of the challenge of this. It's almost there. I need like two big pushes. Oh, that's it. That was it. Let's go. Yes. Oh my God. 
So deep inside there, that little bolt and that hole, that's what I've been trying to line up. That is the torque converter that will connect to the flex plate, and that's exactly what we want. So I should be able to pry this back a little bit, and hopefully it will seat a bit more now. Hey, so before I show you this massive achievement, if you're not subscribed, please consider hitting that subscribe button now. It really does help the channel, and your reward in this case is, look at this, we can put a motor mount bolt in, baby! Woohoohoo! That is a massive achievement. Some factory red Loctite on there, so I'm gonna have to get a wrench on there and put some more on it, but look at that! It works! The other one is super close to being lined up, and then I gotta continue finagling with the transmission. It's really close, but as you can see, there's still a bit of a gap. The other massive achievement is now that we know that the engine is in its home, we can officially get this out of the way. I'm so excited about that. Look at that. Well, we're basically out of daylight, but the bell housing is finally linked up. What I ended up doing was running that bolt back through here, the one that I used to lift the engine. And then I went down on the other side to the starter side and put a bolt in, which helped me kind of pull it in a little bit. Then I was able to pry it just slightly enough to get that bolt in and then just kind of drag the transmission to the engine. The uh, transmission in this case is supported by the uh, back end of the block. So pretty imperative that I got all that, but that's all situated now. And then there's one bell housing bolt on this side right there and that one's tightened down. And then there's three more on this other side. Those are one there, one there, and then one right down here. And all three of those are tightened down. So our transmission is officially reattached to the engine. So exciting. Hey. No more wooden fence post as a hood strut. Got two new hood struts. They're so cheap. It's crazy how cheap hood struts are. So I got a little carried away last night and I went ahead and got the starter on here. Uh, pretty easy. It's only three bolts. Um, and then the wires on the back is three more bolts, but I wanted to try to fit the exhaust tubing in here because I know that that's kind of our next big challenge. Most of the other things is going to be small stuff like wiring and hoses and stuff. Um, but it looks like I'm going to have to pull out the exhaust studs because otherwise there's just not enough room to fit this thing up in here. And I need to mock it up against the starter because from what I understand, so to start off with, I think I only need to take off these three studs. So that's what I'm gonna start with. And then if we have to take off more, we'll do that. But I don't want to take them all out if we don't have to. All right, so lesson learned here, pull out all the studs and then it's a whole lot easier. <laughs> It almost, it almost seems like it just fits. And I don't even have to clearance anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and tighten down the motor mount bolt before I do this, because I think once the exhaust gets in there, it's gonna be way more difficult. Slot this back in. Oh, torque wrench won't fit with the starter on. <laughs> Not good. 45 isn't that much, so we'll just use our regular ratchet and just go until it feels good. Now, we're gonna need to get this exhaust manifold gasket behind the exhaust and run those studs through at the same time. Once we get like two or three of them on, it'll be easier, but I think it's gonna not be fun for the first part. No. I hope the exhaust mod works. I don't want to do this again. So it will, it will work. I'm willing that into the universe. Okay, so checking in about 20 or 30 minutes later and you can see that most of the studs are in and the exhaust is mostly in its position except this one up here and then the lower right one are not in and those are being really tricky. So what I'm gonna try to do now is take some of the nuts and I'm gonna slot those on and then just try to hold the exhaust closer to where it needs to be. This one here, I can't get a socket on, so I probably have to go buy a six millimeter wrench. These other ones are gonna be pretty tough. So it's taken me about 30 minutes to get to this point and probably still a good while yet. Well, ran into another problem. These nuts have this stupid little tooth thing in them. So they're extremely difficult to tighten. And the one that I can actually even get on with a real wrench is so difficult. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's gonna be impossible if you had to do it with an open end on some of these others, which we're gonna have to do anyway. So, and go pick some better nuts up, and then, um, you know, we gotta get a six millimeter wrench, which doesn't appear there's one locally. Oh, it's always something. 
So I went ahead and made the executive decision to get rid of this little plastic shield. It actually is straight and it runs right along the inner, inner side of the frame rail here, um, but it didn't have quite enough clearance as I wanted, even though I banged in that runner. Uh, but now that that shield is missing and the runner is banged in, it fits perfectly. So to deal with that hardware later. Well, Ace didn't have a six millimeter wrench, so I bought a quarter inch, which is the next one. And of course, it's just a hair too small. That's really annoying. But they did have a better kind of nut here. And that one is probably chewed up from that stupid little like thing that was on it. That little claw that I showed you on that old one. But then like this one should just pop right on. Yeah, perfect as it should be. So on the other manifold, we have this fitting here, which is normally for the EGR tube on the driver's side of the car. And that's not something that I'm gonna be running. I luckily don't have to worry about the kind of emissions checks and stuff. So we have this big cap that was included with the EGR block off kit that I bought. So obviously it goes on, it's a little loose until it, until it gets down there and then it's snug. So I'm gonna go ahead and just apply a little bit of the Ultra Copper Gasket Maker, which is for exhaust specifically. I'm just gonna run that kind of on the inside of the threads and that way hopefully this seals up nice and good. This probably isn't even necessary to be honest, but I just wanna make sure that there's no exhaust leak at all. We'll tighten her down. And now this manifold is ready. See if it's easier on the driver's side than the passenger side. Wow, it is so close in this case. Pretty sure I only need to take off the last two studs because that lower one over here is what's holding it up. But look at how close it is. Gotta get the gasket on, take those two studs out, pop this on, and we might be able to get one manifold on at least tonight, which would be great. Uh, it's dark. It's been two hours and I was like, oh, let me go ahead and put the motor mount bolt in. Yeah, the truck and God both laughed in my friggin' face. I got it in, but it just wouldn't line up. And then I was like, oh, I got a genius idea. I was like, I'll stick this through it to align it, and then I'll just tap it through with the bolt. You know, just tap the bolt through on the other side until I can get it to the threads. Turns out this is too big to fit through the threaded hole, even though it looks smaller than the bolt. And then it took me forever to get it unstuck. Ultimately, the way that I did it was just tried to like loosen various combinations of the engine mount bolts, use the jack, the jack up the car. And you can probably hear in my voice, I am exhausted. I'm so beyond pissed off. I, 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 I went to put the exhaust in two hours later, I put one bolt in and the exhaust is still on the ground. Oh boy. Well, I think now I can put the exhaust in for real at least. So I'm gonna do that so I at least feel like I have some sense of accomplishment tonight before I stop. Cause I don't know if I said this already, but that was two hours of fighting. 7.17 to 9.23 p.m. Over two, oh my gosh, I don't even wanna say that out loud. Let's get the exhaust on, holy crap. Well, it's about 30 minutes later and this manifold is fully on. Every bolt is tightened down, manifold is rock solid. No danger to this manifold. Interestingly, on this farthest runner back here, you can see that that one's a bolt instead of a stud. That stud was just never ever going to fit in there because of the curve of this runner. So luckily I did manage to find a bolt in my box of bolts. It's a class 8.8. .8. Not sure if it's stainless steel, might regret that later. Do I care tonight? Absolutely not. Driver's side manifold is on. Back the next day and now what I wanna to try to do is knock out some of the small things like getting the torque converter bolts back in there, which are these nuts, and then we can put this cover back on. So just accomplishing these little things for me kind of helps keep motivation going, even the small tasks. Then, you know, before you know it tonight, I'm gonna be doing something crazy like the exhaust again. Um, didn't feel like working on it today, but if I can get it done in the next couple of days, we'll be exactly three months on this project, which would be incredible. So I'm not really gonna be able to show you, but up here is what we wanna get to. So it doesn't seem like I have any of the studs sticking out right here, so I need to go turn the engine over by hand. But I basically just have to turn the engine over, then stick one of these nuts up in there and tighten it down, and then I can put that cover on. Now, actually, there is one right there. I just can't feel it from here. So I can get one of them, which is good. Fourth and final torque converter bolt going on. That actually wasn't too bad. All right, torque converter is done. Let's get the drive shaft in. Why walk around when you can go under? Oh, it's up there's a booby trap. Yeah. 
tons of cobwebs. This is not very elegant. All right. Up and over. Okay. Now the other side. This end of the drive shaft, we want to make sure to match up to the old marks that was there. We have to spin the diff. I'm gonna have to use the tire because I can't spin the transmission because it's fighting the engine. Leg torque to the rescue. Too far, too far. There we go. Oh, at least there's two in there now so it won't fall out. Now to go find the torque spec. 70 foot pounds on these bolts. I don't think I'm gonna be able to properly torque these. There's just too much flop in this stuff. So I'm just gonna go by hand and do my best. Okie dokie, that'll do. The next thing we're gonna do is tighten down these transmission cross member bolts. And that should finish up almost all of what we need to do under the car, uh, other than just finishing the exhaust. Every time I say drive shaft or think about a drive shaft, I always think of Charlie from Lost and his band. Drive shaft, you've heard of us? And I am super happy to report that this manifold is on and tightened down now. This one is a little bit tougher because you just need a different combination of wrenches and stuff, but I had to order the six millimeter one, which came in. I accidentally ordered the ratcheting one, but it, it helped a lot because um, some of these studs like these two, you can't get to really at all except through this. So the ability to ratchet it, even though you have to be like, ting, 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 that is nice. So this one is all tightened down. And just to give you an idea, in case you're watching this and you're trying to install long tubes on your F-150, you're gonna need one of these like really thin walled 13s. You can see like that silver one is so much thicker with the ratcheting one. Uh, so I have this, you know, Harbor Freight 13 and this thing is critical because there's a bunch of studs in here that you're not gonna be able to get on, like this one, for instance, unless you have something thin like this and then you can get in there and turn it. But otherwise the angle is just too intense. Like if I took this 13, you can see it just doesn't fit. And then you're kind of forced to do that. But then in some cases like this, you can't actually even get a turn on it because you hit the, the manifold runner. So I'm gonna need a curious assortment of tools. Anyway, long story short, both manifolds are on and tight. Let's go. So I just took the little plastic cover off the AC compressor and we need to get this hard line put back on. Will the AC work? <laughs> I don't know. Is it? Is there some other problem in the system? Very likely, but I wanted to have a new compressor because I really want to get the AC working in this truck. So I've been meticulously studying this intake manifold to figure out what we have to do next. There was just a bunch of questions like, there's a bunch of vacuum ports and hose ports and stuff that I couldn't figure out where they go in relation to the F-150 setup. I think I have it under control now, but I have to figure out the heater core lines and let me show you that. So on this manifold, we have this line, which will connect to the heater core. Uh, and then we also have this one. So the navigator manifold is a little bit different in the way that it works. So we're gonna reuse this one and this one is gonna connect to the firewall on the truck. Um, this one we're just going to cap off because we don't need this one. The setup on the navigator is different. And I wanna go ahead and get this sorted out while the intake manifold is not in because those are the heater core lines. There's one there and one right there. So we gotta get those off. Uh, but this horrendous insulation, as you can see, is hanging down and it's actually like, it must be fiberglass or something because it made my arms itchy a minute ago when I was trying to get it. And as you can see, it's making a big mess of dust everywhere, which is kind of disappointing. Here are the remains of those lines. So these might have never been swapped or if they were, they were a very long time ago because there should be like this white plastic stuff in here, but this is so old, it's turned brown. And then the other connector just snapped. These O-rings are hard as a rock, but luckily it is off now. Uh, I think that would be, basically impossible with the with the truck in the car i mean i mean the intake manifold in the car um especially with the navigator one because it's going to sit so high up here so this is pretty critical to do now but now what i want to do is hook up a hose to this and just like run some water through it so i can flush the heater core okay so i've temporarily rigged this up i'm going to stick my garden hose on the end of that i'm going to pull it up oh i can't reach it <laughs> i'm just going to pull it up like this just spray it down in there and then this long tube will run all the way over here to the ground. And from what I see online, all kinds of crap should come out of it. So let's see how it goes. Yeah, it's, it's working. It's coming out the other side. 
It's clean though, it's very clean. I expected it to be filthy dirty. This is all clean water dripping down here. So, no problemo. That was kind of not necessary, but at least now I know. Also, so as you can see, this intake manifold is actually three pieces. We got this lower one, we have the upper one, and then there's also even another third piece right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do a couple of the things that are easy while we have it right here. I'm gonna get the thermostat in and got the new gasket and then the thermostat neck. This thing is pretty ugly, but I can't find a replacement one uh, that's a reasonable cost. Maybe I'll end up replacing it if it leaks, but I think it'll be fine, even though it's ugly. Um, so we'll go ahead and just slot this on. Brand new OEM thermostat and gasket. They were super cheap. On every other thermostat that I've done, this O-ring usually slots around the outside edge. But for whatever reason, in this case, it just kind of chills in the front. So that's how it goes. I'm going to stick this little nub up. Gasket will just rest in there. Done. So now what I'm going to do is go ahead and just plug these holes with paper towels because these are going to become our new entry points. Once we lay down the gasket and put this on, then these are the open holes into the engine. The other thing we can do while we have it here is I think we can go ahead and get the fuel rail on, I'm pretty sure, because these are the injector holes and the fuel rail just bolts to these holes right here. Speaking of fuel injectors, the fuel rail is this kind of crazy all one piece rig. Looks pretty similar to the F-151, except on the navigator, the input and kind of fuel return ports are on the left side. And I think on the F-150, they're like over here. Uh, these are either no longer made or not available or something like that. I looked for a new one and they were not available. So I'm just gonna rock with this one. And then this thing smells really bad. So it needs a break clean bath. It's crazy how fast you ran out of break clean. It's like green coming out of there. Is that just what the color of old fuel is like? So then the fuel rail will just kind of come around like this and it will just sit like that. I think I'm gonna go ahead and make, uh, you know, get the injectors in place here because it'll be a lot easier on this table while I can reach everything than when it's in the truck, I believe. I was just like, hey man, like. So then we should just be able to slot this down now right on top of the injectors and make sure they're all kind of roughly seated in their homes. Oh, that one's seated now. There we go. That should all be seated, I think. And then, yeah, the bolt holes are really close. So that should be good to go on this side. So I'm gonna go ahead and bolt this down and then I'll do the others. Oh, that must be an eight. I'm gonna push it down because it's got some markings where it looks like it was seated in the past. Okay. So the next challenge that I have here is this PCV hose will connect, uh, that one right here connects to the barb on the valve cover. Then this one here goes into that port on the side of the manifold. And then this one, as you can see, just kind of fits nicely right there. And then what actually went in this port is this fitting right here. Ford wants $200 for this fitting, which is absolutely outrageous. And these two lines on the outside are for the heated PCV, which we're actually just getting rid of entirely. We don't need that. That's what this line is right here. So this one would connect to one of the outer arms on this, but otherwise this is just a straight pass through. There you can see the light down there. That's just a straight pass through for the PCV. So it's just gonna pull vacuum. So I'm having a hard time finding a barb fitting that's smooth on one end and has a hose barb on the other. So what I realized was I have a 1 8 NPT tap and it fits basically perfectly in there. Obviously I gotta get it started straight and then it will it will just be good. But I'm thinking what I might do is just tap in this 1 8 NPT thread. See, it's actually just kind of working. Like I'm barely even having to put any force on it. So I would tap in some 1 8 NPT thread on that side and then I could turn that into the 3 quarter, um, or 3 8, excuse me, 3 8 inch hose barb, which would just it'd be the equivalent of this side. So I'd just be replacing this $200 fitting with an $8 hose barb, and then our hose, uh, where did it go? Right here. That one would then just connect to the barb fitting. So I think, I think that's gonna work. So another super interesting thing that I uh, couldn't figure out is why was the front of the engine, the old motor, totally covered in oil like this? So you can see that whole side of the valve cover in this photo, or the front cover there, 
It's completely black with oil. And what I realized is this old hose right here is actually connected to the intake tube and it's split right there. So this was probably connected to the intake and it was just spewing oil out of this, you know, oil vapors out of that hole and that rip in the hose. And I couldn't actually find that hose. So this stupid Dorman PCV thing that actually didn't even really work kind of came in handy. I just pulled all the fittings off. So this fits perfectly over my new intake and this side just goes right into the valve cover. So got the PCV line situated. It was kind of a headache to figure all that out, but eventually I got it. I know this is a complete disaster and it probably doesn't make much sense when all of this is not in the car and you don't see where the hoses are routed to, but I promise in the very near future, this will all make sense. Also, I forgot to show you this, but since we're deleting the whole EGR system as well, like I showed you on the exhaust pipe, this is where the EGR actually comes in in the navigator manifold. So I bought this like $30 block off plate um, and then had to get my own hardware, but it worked beautifully. It came with a little gasket and now the EGR won't be a problem. We don't have to fiddle with all that nonsense. Time to tap. This is always a little bit nerve wracking for me, but really we don't have a whole lot to lose. I mean, the intake is off of the car right now. So worst case, I just have to drill it a little bit bigger and either try again or find a different size barb. So let's just go ahead and send it. Oh, this is working so nice since it's just aluminum we're going into. It's like not a problem at all. It's just cutting right through. I know we kind of risk blowing the chips inside of it, but we're going to have to take this off and blow it all out anyway. It looks tapped really good, actually. So you can definitely see some of the metal flakes. Ooh, actually, you guys can see down in the intake more than I ever have. That's kind of cool. So yeah, I probably need to just run some water through it, quite honestly, just flush everything out. But look at that. Our port is tapped. It looks really good. I'm super pleased with that. It looks like might have tapped a bit further down over there, which is honestly okay. Just a couple of threads is gonna be more than enough in this case. I mean, there's this is just pulling vacuum. It's not like we're gonna be boosted or anything crazy. And we could really just, you know, put some uh, like thread sealant or whatever on there and that would be perfectly fine. That works so good, yes! So we need a couple more things that I had to order, like this barb fitting, a cap for this, uh, and some various other things. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and start to just kind of prepare some things in here. So we need to get this power steering line down there tightened up. I wanna flush out this overflow reservoir tank. And then the other thing, if possible, is I wanna try to go ahead and bleed the brakes because that fluid is just old and disgusting, I'm sure. And for that first drive, I wanna have solid brakes. So just some minor things, um, nothing too crazy. I think what I'll do is show you the brake bleeding because I bought a universal bleeder. Um, they say should work for this car. So we'll see if that does the trick because power bleeders are sweet. I don't know what it is about power steering lines like that, but that was so insanely difficult. It took me over an hour. I took a break for like 30 minutes, but it took me over an hour to tighten that one nut. It just would not line up. So I ended up having to kind of like bend the line and I'm pretty sure this black part is supposed to kind of go underneath this hose right here. It should kind of go around the box, but like there was just no way it was gonna work any other way. I mean, I just, I don't know how else it would have worked. You haven't seen this yet, but I did the st steering rack on the Land Cruiser and that was equally terrible. Evidently there's something to do with power steering lines that are the bane of my existence or <laughs> I don't have the right tools or something, but like that was unbelievably difficult. Holy crap. So I mentioned these power bleeders are so cool because basically it builds pressure and connects to the brake reservoir and then right now it's empty and I'll explain why in a minute, but normally you'd have brake fluid in there and then you can just go to each wheel and bleed it. And it comes with this little collector bucket. You just stick the hose onto, uh, you know, the backside of the caliper. And what we'll do in a second is pour brake fluid in this. But what we want to wait for is this is pumped up to about 15 pounds. Uh, so we just want to double check that our brake system holds pressure, which it looks like it does. I didn't get quite to 15, but we should be able to hold that pressure for you know, a solid 10 or 15 minutes with no real loss. Then once we do that, we'll just unscrew the big black top there. And then uh, we'll pour you know a bunch of brake fluid in the actual white reservoir. Then we'll go around to each corner and bleed and it'll just push this old yucky black fluid out and we'll have nice new clean brake fluid. While we wait for that, I wanna clean as best I can the inside of this coolant reservoir. It's a little yucky and yellow in there. So I'm just gonna brake clean a little bit. I know brake clean's not good for plastic. So to just break up any of the loose dirt and contaminants. 
and then we're immediately going to flush it with this water. So now, just dump this right in and it's just gonna pour out the bottom. Which is exactly what I want. Perfect, I'm gonna keep going. And then I'm gonna do the same thing to the power steering reservoir so it's not apocalyptically dirty when we go to put it back on. Okay, so it's been about 10 minutes and we haven't lost any pressure at all, which is perfect. That's exactly what we want. So what I'll do now is go ahead and just pop this seal. And then and what I'm gonna do now is just fill it up with a fresh thing of dot four brake fluid. Probably more than we need, but once you open these things, you really can't reuse them. They attract water and then the brake fluid is no longer viable. So I'll just fill it up and we just basically use one per car. Luckily, they're not that expensive. Then again, just tighten this bad boy down. And then I'm just gonna pump it back up. And you can see it's already starting to flow, which is cool. So now what we're gonna do is come to the farthest wheel away from the master cylinder first. I'm gonna take our little thingy here. Then we find the bleeder nipple, which is right here. And it actually takes a 3 8 Nine millimeters too small and 10 millimeters too big. So 3 8 is right in the middle. And then our bottle is just kind of hanging. So we should just be able to open up this bleeder screw. Hopefully this works. And of course it's going to slip. That is wonderful. I think I got lucky here, but this is not the normal way to do this. So <laughs> I ended up having to find a 3 8 socket, which luckily I have one of them and then loosen it up, but it just felt really bad. So I left it there and shoved the hose inside the socket. Definitely made a bit of a mess, which I'll have to clean out. But you can see that now that power bleeder is pushing all of that old brake fluid out exactly like we want. There's a bunch of bubbles in it, which is fine because um, our hose probably isn't connected properly. But all we want to do is see that this fluid starts to turn clear instead of yellow. And you can see how dirty that old fluid is. This probably hasn't been flushed in I would guess 100,000 miles or more. So this is really good for us. Good, good, good. Now to just repeat on all the other wheels and I'll let you know if I run into any more challenges. The other thing is while you're doing this, you wanna check the pressure every once in a while. And then also make sure that you don't run dry on fluid because you have to restart the whole process over because once the fluid is gone, you just introduce air to the system, which is obviously no bueno. So after all that mess, we have about three quarters, let's see, about right right here on the bottle of what we extracted out, all dark, dark brake fluid. Uh, so now we know we have some good fresh fluid in there, which is awesome. These tools are incredible. I was able to use this both for my BMW. It takes a separate fitting on the end, but they're swappable. You can just stick it right in the middle. So, so I'll leave a link to this in the description if you're interested, definitely. I've only used this now twice, but it's worth every single penny. Moment of truth, the fitting has arrived and it's going to work oh yeah boom baby almost looks like thread tape but it's a thread sealant sauce it smells like peaches and cream oatmeal or maybe that's because i had that this morning now for the moment of truth did i actually measure all this stuff properly so this one would go up here this one goes down here and Ooh, like butter, it fits on there so perfectly. That's awesome. Now for the moment of truth, did I actually measure all this stuff properly? So this one would go up here, this one goes down here, and ooh, like butter, it fits on there so perfectly. That's awesome. All right, so in case you ever need to know this, just buy a 3 8 barb fitting and it works beautifully. That will go there. This one in the middle goes down there, and that one goes to the valve cover. So now we have both sides of our PCV situated. Let's go. Next up is to try to see if any of these O-rings in this kit that I bought will work on the little water pump outlet right here. Oh, those O-rings might be too big. Might need to go another step down. Oh, I gotta go to the store and buy the right size. Oh! Of course, nowhere has that locally, so O'Reilly's is gonna order it for me and it will be here tomorrow. Let's knock off some other small things on the checklist to at least try to keep the motivation up. So this is one of the PCV hoses. This will go in the back. And then once we have the new intake in, this fitting is going to attach uh, basically at a right angle to the hose like that. So we suck in oil vapor straight to the intake, which is great. And then we can also put on the power steering reservoir bracket. 
this will go somewhere roughly in like this. Now things start to get a little tricky because we need to be careful, like the throttle cable lines, those are tucked down here, but that's not really where they belong. So I gotta kind of just double check everything as I go to make sure just like that, that would have been annoying. Power steering line was in between those. Power steering reservoir is officially on. So now I'm gonna try to slip in this lower radiator hose, this one here. This just kind of goes roughly like that. This one's gonna go down there, that one to the radiator, and then this one to that nipple on the tank, just like that. Not the biggest fan of paying five bucks for two rubber circles, but at least it exists. This is the Felpro part number that I bought from the local O'Reilly's, so it'll work at least. It's amazing what happens when you have the right parts. Coolant tube is on. All right, so we got a really big moment coming. We're gonna be able to finally peel off our intake covers here and then we'll be able to lay down our gasket and then we can put the lower intake on. I can hardly believe it. We're finally here. This tape has served us well. Oh yeah, look at that. Corners are all still perfectly clean. And this gasket's got these little tabs for the left side. This whole portion of the intake was absolutely disgusting when I pulled it off. I'll pull up a photo and you can kind of compare like all the dirt and the grime that was along here just from valve cover leaks and just everything. It's really, really wild. Quite honestly, I don't really understand why this manifold has to be so complicated in three pieces. But alas, oh, oh God, it's so heavy. Okay, like that. Already looks good. Okay, so just simple 10 millimeters to run them down. What I need to do now is get the fuel lines hooked up back there. And then I need to go through and just hand tighten all of these bolts. The torque spec is only 17 foot pounds, so it's not much. I can probably get the torque wrench in there. Uh, so I'm gonna do that for as many of them as I can. Torque them down, fuel rail on. Then we will go ahead and we can connect the injectors. The harnesses luckily are kind of just sitting here. So it's gonna be easy to just pop all those in like that. And we're gonna be making some serious progress. So I got hung up on this for a while. I couldn't figure out where are these vacuum lines all kind of connect to? So we have this factory connector that's got these three plugs coming off of it. So this just goes into the intake manifold. Uh, I'll show you the port where later. The red one goes to the fuel pressure regulator. So that's sorted. But then I was like, well, what are these other two for? Well, one of them connected to this little T right here to provide vacuum for a line that runs right down here and goes through the firewall to the HVAC controls. And then the other one was for the EGR. And of course we deleted that. So this line, we can basically just cap off. Instead of trying to make my own new line, which I certainly could do, I don't really want to run to the hardware store and buy a bunch of different hoses and tees and stuff. I'm just going to kind of connect this stuff up and then cap off the ports we don't need. And we're going to be good. So now we can proceed. So we'll just take our little connector here. Just plug that right into the fuel pressure regulator. Okay, so now I just want to do a little bit of test fitting, see like what kind of problems I'm going to run into to get this working. So I'm just going to kind of rest this up in its place. So I ended up just taking off this third piece because otherwise those bolts back there are going to be completely inaccessible. But the good news is that I was able to kind of push these coolant lines out of the way. So there's this big one that's going to come up to this one right here. But then there's also the one that runs to that, you know, valley tube that we already installed earlier. That one I was able to just kind of push up out of the way. And then I checked all of our bolt holes line up back there. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this back off, take the paper towel kind of blockers out, and then we can continue putting this beast on. This thing is so freaking huge. I think it's gonna be a little tricky to get these bolts all in. This one goes down here. And then these, most of them are pretty self-explanatory. A couple of spots where Seems like they would go in like right there, but they don't because there's nothing underneath that. And then these are the ones back here that I was a little bit concerned about. But with that third intake manifold piece off, it goes right in. Alrighty, all the bolts are on this upper intake now. So I got to get this third piece in. Uh, but in case you're doing this, you're going to need a quarter drive ratchet with a little bendy bit. Uh, the one that's right down in here, very tough to get to without that bender. Um, 
other than that, it's starting to come together. This is so exciting. All right, let's get this final piece of the intake kind of bashed back in there. So we need to make sure we got our gaskets on. That is intake manifold officially on. Next up, throttle body time. Throttle body is on, except I forgot to put the potentiometer on the side, which means I might have to take it back off because it's too Phillips head and that might not be possible. Okay, time for us to get this other PCV hose, which will go right here in this valve cover. And of course, I already mentioned that I swapped these grommets and this is a factory Motorcraft PCV valve because I read online that aftermarket ones can be really terrible and cause problems. And this little valve was 25 bucks, but whatever. I wanna do this stuff right the first time. Our custom made barb, then we'll do this one up here. Perfecto. And last but not least, onto the belt valve cover barb. And then our little vacuum port that I showed you earlier, that just plugs in right there, right under here on the intake. But I'm gonna do this so it's a little bit cleaner. Just like that. And then this one we can just point down because we're gonna cap that black one off and then we need to cap the other one off. So we'll do that later. Now we're really deep into the tons of other small things phase because we've got this port right here which will be this one, which is the EVAT purge. We've got a plug-in um, IACV, or actually this one is brake booster. This one is EVAT purge. Uh, I'm not bothering with any of the EGR DPF stuff. Um, what is it called? There's some four letter acronym for the little things that plug in over there. And that's what these two connectors are, but we're not worried about those. Then we got a fill up power steering reservoir, uh, oil in, coolant in, content, like hook up the radiator hoses, radiator in. We're really, really, really close. This is crazy. Okay, so in my case, this one for the EVAP purge uh, setup here is way longer than I need it. So I'm just gonna go get a little pair of clippers. This hose is rock hard too. I'm gonna need to swap that out pretty soon. This fancy fuel line, hose clamp is overkill for this, but it's all I got. So we're gonna rock it. Okay, and then this brake booster tube is a little bit different on the FM50. So I'm gonna pull this out. It's got this like, metal pipe fitting, but, but the end on the navigator is the same. So I'm gonna go get that one and swap it in. Basically the same, just simpler. Okay, so then this plug right here, IACV, right on. Take off my little label. So now I gotta figure out how to disconnect these cables out of this F150 bracket, because as you can see, the navigator throttle cable bracket is already there. Looks like these are just little push clips, but these are always a challenge. Hopefully it's easy. Oh yeah, it actually looks like it will be. Wow. I expected that to be an unbelievable fight. Slot in like that. Wow. <laughs> I expected to be fighting that until the sun went down. Or actually in this truck, it'll be Cool, so the pedal was fully down. Doesn't seem like it comes all the way back up. I guess it does. We'll have to see if it idles high because it doesn't seem like the throttle plate closes all the way. It just feels so loosey goosey. I need to tighten that somehow. I mislabeled quite a few other things here. This says alternator, that is not the alternator. This is the throttle um, potentiometer cable there. And then this one is this temp sensor. I can just plug this one in while we got the chance. Boom. Thing after thing after thing is coming together. Really awesome. So then down here, we can plug in our camshaft sensor. Finally. Let's get this other coolant situation figured out. So I'm going from a three-quarter hose here uh, off of this barb, and then I got a three-eighths to five-eighths adapter to connect it to the heater core so i need to kind of figure out where i want to position these i stole this off of the land cruiser i forget from what a nice little constant tension spring clamp Ooh, that's gonna blow off won't it or will it eh, i think it'll be fine if we overheat it might blow off and then now i'm gonna use the wrong type of clamp and use a cv boot clamp I don't have another one, okay? You know what would help the throttle return is if I put the actual spring on it. Wow, I'm glad I found that. The throttle actuator, 
So now, now it goes back like I was talking about. That's what it should do. That ain't going nowhere. Two possible failure points on the cooling system is that connection right there and then the bar, but I think we'll be good. All right, let's get the alternator on. Oh, I guess I should have hooked up. Oh, no, I don't know this car that well. I should have hooked up the power cables because they're way in the back and now I can't reach them. Oh, that's so annoying. Okie dokie, now it's officially on with all the wires connected. That is really awesome. And what's next? Now I wanna swap out this transmission pan gasket because as you can see, it is completely covered in oil and it just constantly is leaking. Funny enough, it says pan is equipped with a reusable gasket. <laughs> I think this gasket has seen better days. So we're gonna drop this pan. Unfortunately, there's no drain on it. So it's just a matter of pulling the pan and trying not to make an enormous mess. All right, they're all loose. So I'm gonna get all of them out except like three and then I'll take them out by hand. So, oh, I better go get some towels because I'm already making a mess. Okay, so then we'll just lower this down slowly. I don't know how much fluid is still in here. Quite a lot has leaked out during this removal and reassembly process. So I'm not sure to be honest. Ah, it's already raining. No, I don't have a pan. No! Oh, this is a disaster. Most of it ended up on this cardboard, at least, but that is not what I intended. Welcome to the war zone. I honestly just didn't expect that it would be this full. I mean, that pan is kind of deep, so maybe I underestimated it. Probably because this thing has been sitting, this truck has been sitting for so long that I bet the vast majority of the transmission fluid just kind of made its way down into the pan, but a lot of cleanup work on my part here. Look at this pan, man. Like there's so much caked up dirt and grime all along the edges of this. Looks like new. So after about 50 minutes of suffering, I got the new pan and the new gasket on and not only pain and suffering, but also intense fluid loss. But then I also forgot to plug in this ground strap and it goes from this point on the firewall right here, it's supposed to go to the back of the cylinder head where that coolant tube we worked with the other day uh, connects to as well, but I can't reach it. I'm not undoing all of this stuff to go plug in that ground strap. So I'm just tying in this ground strap to this little alternator bracket. And I think we will be solid. Um, if we have ground issues, that'll be the first one I check. Well, I temporarily moved on to other things. I wanted to get something else done. So I got the serpentine belt on, which is great. Although I may have accidentally bought a six rib belt and I needed to buy an eight. So as you can see, I had to extend the wires on the O2 sensor because they just simply weren't long enough. So I soldered in some extra wires last night. And then I also had to drill out the little center resonator thing because otherwise the O2 sensor doesn't fit in there, but now it does. So I can get this mocked up on one side. So after what feels like an eternity of waiting, I can finally get these radiator clamps on. I bought this tool here that kind of compresses these. It's attached to this long cable and then there's these handles and this is just kind of at the max of how big it can go. But these constant tension clamps are really good, but they're really tough to fight with sometimes. So I'm gonna go ahead and slide this on and then I'll be able to use this, grab onto this, lock it open, slide it on, then you can just release it. So this should be much more smooth, especially with the compact area I'm gonna be fighting with down there. Well, it was still really difficult, but I did manage to get it on there. That tool did help a lot. It was 30 bucks and I'm gonna get tons of use out of it because there's the spring clamps all over the place on this car. And then there's tons of them on Toyotas. So it's gonna be a useful tool to have for sure. Now what I can do, since I got the other end of this connected to the coolant overflow reservoir is we can get the radiator back in, which is pretty awesome. Then connect up these um, transmission cooler lines, fill it up with coolant, oil, transmission fluid. And then the only other thing is connecting up the exhaust. So the long tubes to the actual factory exhaust is two inches and these are three. So these are technically supposed to be joining um, exhaust pieces together, like when they're kind of touching, but I'm gonna try and see if I can get it so that the long tube ends here, factory one kind of ends here. This will kind of act as the joiner. And then I'm planning to take it to an exhaust shop and have them like actually do something more legit but this will be good enough for now so that we can start it and it's not excruciatingly loud. So 
I'm gonna get this mocked up and then I'll show you what it looks like. So here's what the finished product looks like. So the end of the long tube header is right up there. Then there's this little connector thing that the O2 goes into, which I showed you guys before. And then this little adapter that I bought off Amazon, 2.5 inch kind of exhaust coupler goes on this far side. And this pipe is exactly 2.5 outside diameter. This one is more like two and three eighths, like just shy of two and a half. So luckily this thing crimps down hard enough. It looks all really solid. And then as you can see, I use some of the orange copper exhaust gasket maker. So this side is good. Unfortunately, I didn't measure over there and I also wasn't the one that cut these pipes out. Uh, that one is more than three inches. That one is just barely beyond what my little coupler will do. So I don't know what I'm gonna do there. Maybe I can find a small like two inch piece of exhaust coupler and then put them on or something. I don't know, not sure yet. So ah, I wasn't anticipating yet another hurdle. In the meantime, let's get that radiator in so we can get all the fluids in too. That'll be like one of the very last things. Cool. Oh, I forgot about the fan shroud and the fan. And just like that, lower radiator hose is on. The two transmission cooler lines are on. So this of course is the F-150 radiator hose, which would normally go somewhere over there, kind of in the center of the intake manifold on that setup. But of course with the navigator, it's right here. So I basically just need to kind of trim that hose right here. And then if I need to in the future, I'll, of course, I'll just order the navigator one. So we're gonna use our handy dandy little cutter and just snip her off. Well, of course, your boy trimmed it too short, but I think we'll be able to be, yeah, I think we're fine for now because the edge of that thing is right here so I can get a clamp on it nice and secure. Oh, it's already leaking on the bottom rat hose. Heck yeah. I guess it's because that clamp isn't perfectly positioned where it used to be, so I need to fix that and try again. Oh, the number of challenges on this is so insane. Turns out that clamp was kind of like cockeyed a little bit, so it wasn't fully on the hose. It was partially on that housing piece too, so of course it was going to leak, but let's do another attempt here. So that's about as good as it's gonna get, I think. It's dripping about one drop every, I don't know, maybe five to seven seconds, as you can see and that's more than I would like. So what I'm gonna do is just basically not fill it up until right when I'm ready to start it. Since it's just distilled water, it's no problem for it to leak out a little bit. And then I'm fairly certain that this hose will expand and kind of seat better once it actually warms up. The clamp will kind of position itself. So I'm not gonna worry about it. I wanna go ahead and put in the power steering fluid into the, um, it, it puts some AC, ATF into the power steering system, get that filled. I've always found it so interesting that many different power steering systems take ATF fluid. I don't really know why that is, but that's what it calls for. So that's what we're going to send it with. Oh, there it is. Yeah, this is, I saw someone online said it takes less than a quart, even when you open up the system. And sure enough, this is like only 40% down. I'm sure once the pump gets going, it'll pull more into the system, but for now, doesn't need that much. Let's go ahead and continue the ATF trend here. Get this transmission topped up as best we can before it starts. Again, just like power steering system, it's gonna suck more in once it actually gets running, but I wanna go ahead and just fill it back up since we emptied the pan. Then our next vehicular fluid is the cheapest possible regular oil non-synthetic. Um, this one does say synthetic, but I couldn't find a single of just regular conventional, but we want to run conventional for our first start. However, we're only going to run it until it gets up to operating temperature. We run it for about 20 minutes and then we shut it off immediately during the oil. And then we're going to go with a SAE 30 break-in oil. I'm going to use a funnel. And then we might as well make some more progress and stick this fan on. I've never actually installed one of these clutch fans because on the BMW, it's a, it's a manual or like an electric fan. And then in the Land Cruiser, it bolts to the pulley so it all comes off as one assembly. From what I understand though, you should just be able to basically hand tighten this down right here on the snout of the water pump. And then once you basically get it snugged up, then it's good. Getting it off is harder, but it seems like the centrifugal force, once you get it on here, yeah, see, look, it's not even spinning anymore, but the fan can spin. The centrifugal force of it spinning around off the belt drive is enough to keep it on. At least I hope, I'm gonna double check that. Pretty sure. Of course, I don't have the radiator shroud in, so hopefully that can be installed uh, with the fan in. If not, we'll see. Well, it's certainly not pretty. 
<laughs> and it's almost certainly going to leak, but I basically just bought a little three inch piece of exhaust tubing, two and a half inch little connector piece right here. Then I just added the other strap to it and then just lathered that in piece here in exhaust gasket maker all the way around. That is the part that's probably gonna leak. I bet this portion here will be good, but the gasket maker side might leak. So as long as this works, and even if it has a little bit of an exhaust leak, that's no problem. Uh, I'm gonna get it to the exhaust shop at some point and they'll actually make something you know, more legit there. But yeah, I mean, that that is mission accomplished. So now the only thing left is coolant in, intake on, prime the oil pump, turn the key. I just simply could not drill through this thing. So I just bolted it back up for now and we'll worry about that later. We got more important stuff to do, like get this thing running. So you haven't seen this yet, but I have a pretty sweet k and air intake filter. Amazingly, they make a full kit for the navigator motors, which is crazy. The main thing being that this intake elbow is such a strange shape, this U shape, the F-151 won't fit. Um, and then of course the PCV is gonna go into here and then we need to plug in our MAF, which is gonna go further down the line right here. And there actually is a intake air temperature sensor that I have to kind of drill in here, which I'll do another time. I'm not really too worried about that right now because all we have at this point is get this intake on. I at least need to just kind of rudely put it on so that the MAF sensor is plugged in. Then uh, we can plug in the battery. I went ahead and put the battery back. I haven't put it on yet though. And then uh, we'll plug this back in, fill it up with water and then prime the oil pump and try to start it. Hopefully we can do that before the sun goes down. We're running out of light here, but the intake is on. Uh, there's a little bit of a issue right here with this being <laughs> pretty janky. I gotta fix that. But since this is in front of the MAF, I'm not too worried about it. Um, so now let's get this battery tightened down. We can get the truck live and then I'll pour some more coolant in and then we'll try to prime the pump and turn the key. Well, turns out the hazards work. This is so exciting. Oh man, what else is on in here? Anything? Ah. All right, so I haven't put the coolant in, but where did my key go? The dash is still all taken apart in a mess. Let's see what all kind of comes on. We should have, uh-oh, there we go. We're getting something. What do we got? Low coolant warning. What's our gas at? Quarter tank, I'm glad I added that little bit of gas yesterday. I need to do some more. Good battery voltage. Let's see. I guess I put a, better put the coolant in and it'll work. This is so exciting. <laughs> All the lights are on. Oh man, this is so cool. Still tons of air in the cooling system. So it really doesn't want to take more than like the two gallons and it needs like five and a half or something crazy for the whole system. So I don't think there's any reason why we can't go ahead and just turn it over. I unplugged the crank sensor so it shouldn't start. And then that way we can prime the oil pump, uh, prime, you know, I don't think the whole fuel system is primed, so that's gotta be done too, but that'll happen just as we turn it over. So let's move some of this stuff, get it off of the bay here, and then we'll try to turn the key. Kind of nervous like I was when I first turned the key on the BMW, because it's just like, did I, taking the key out for a second. Did I time it properly? Did I forget something? Is everything plugged in? Is it gonna explode? Let's see. I'm gonna give the uh, starter a break every so often. So really what I'm looking for is this sensor, this oil pressure sensor is not actually like a live gauge. It's not gonna move. It's eventually just going to like pop right back up into the middle and that's when I know I have oil pressure and can plug the crank sensor back in and then start it. I figured this would happen, but <laughs> the battery is officially toasted. So I'm gonna charge it overnight and we're gonna do the first startup in the daytime tomorrow. Another day working on this junk. Got the battery charged overnight. So it's full again, got the crank sensor plugged in, and then the cooling system accepted another gallon of coolant. It's about halfway full in the reservoir there, but I'm ready to fire this thing. I was doing some research last night and lots of people use the assembly lube, don't do any other priming and they just fire the engine up. So, you know, I did a bunch of priming last night and we should be good. Although 
Looks like my belt has slipped on the water pump pulley just a little bit. Unless it's because I have a six rib belt and the F-151 is eight rib. Guess we'll have to pay attention to that. Hopefully our serpentine belt doesn't come flying off. All right, let's see what there is to see here. Uh, again, taking the key out so I can explain something. I'm gonna watch to make sure that our oil pressure comes up in like about the first five seconds after the engine is running because that will be more than safe for us. If it doesn't, while the engine is running, I'm gonna kill it. Here we go. Once all our gauges come back down. I don't remember doing that in my dad's truck. Here we go. Five, four, three, there we go. It's alive! Holy crap. It's alive. Doesn't sound that good. Why does it sound so bad? Is that fan clutch? It's alive though! Woo -hoo -hoo. I feel like that's fan clutch making that horrendous racket. It's coming down now. And we definitely do have an exhaust leak. I can smell that. Oh, it smells terrible, all that stuff burning off. We have good oil pressure still, good battery voltage, ABS light is on. Oh. <laughs> That's a horrible noise. Nothing actively leaking. Oh, is that the power steering pump? Maybe that's what that is. That just sucked down all the fluid. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Power steering pump is less mad now that I got it filled up with some more fluid. It's still at its high mark, so just hopeful that it will stop being so angry in a little bit. But otherwise, it sounds good. The engine is smooth. We do have an exhaust leak on this one side. Somewhere up here. And we are getting some smoke at the tailpipe, but it's clearing up as the engine is running more. So this is really good. I'm happy with this. And our power steering pump is basically no longer mad, which is awesome. This is so killer. Are we at operating temperature yet? I wonder if the thermostat's even open. No, it has not. Still got good oil pressure. Gonna give her a little rev here. Oh, that throttle pedal is, whoa, tough, sticky. I guess the way that I had to move these throttle cables last night, it's not happy with it. Yeah, so I guess I'll just kind of do it from the thing itself, from the throttle body itself. Oh yeah, it's not happy, why is that? Well, I can't even press it. Go this way. Yeah, I guess the angle of this cable now is too much. I wonder if that makes it any better. Ooh, it sounds like it's gonna die. Are we leaking anything? Nope. It's running a little rough. It's probably really mad about all, I'm surprised there's no check engine light. Unless it's just burned out on this truck. <laughs> um, surprise there's no check engine lights because we should have like O2 warnings. Oh, what does that sound? Is that belt chirp? Oh yeah, it's the, oh no, the belt is shredding. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Oh shit, damn it. The belt was jumping and then it started to shred. Look at that. Oh no. The shreds of belt got into the clutch, like in between the pulley and the clutch on the AC compressor, which is annoying and problematic and I have to fish that out. I wanna get that out and then I'm just gonna run it. I just wanna keep the engine warmed up and going kind of complete this initial break-in period and then I obviously need a new belt so if it breaks it's no big deal uh so I just want to get that out and then run it again all right got those belt shreds out what's the worst that could happen 
literally nothing. Actually, that's not true. A lot of stuff could happen. A lot of bad stuff could happen. But let's give this a go again. Fires up like, immediately. It's pretty mad about the math. I gotta fix that properly and the exhaust. I just wanted it to get up to full operating temperature because that's when we need to do the first oil change. So I really want that to that belt to survive. Seems like it's way less mad now. And is the belt jumping this time? No. I wonder why. I guess it was as soon as I revved it is when it got mad. I'm also gonna have to go buy or rent a fan clutch tool because now the fan is fully tightened down so I can't loosen it by hand since the engine's been running. Yeah, there's not much meat on that belt. <laughs> it's missing like four ribs. That's crazy. It's so weird, our thermostat still hasn't opened. It's all like, there's still so much fluid in there. I'm kind of surprised actually. But at least our power steering pump's quiet now. It's no longer mad. Fuel level's good. Other than that, I think we're doing pretty well here. Try to rev her a little bit. Oh, we're basically at operating temperature now, as you can see. Oil pressure is still good. Oh my gosh, look at this. <laughs> they told me it had 260,000 miles on it. That apparently is a pretty common issue for the odometer not to come on for a while until after the engine. Uh, you know, the truck's been running for a while. 326,000, that's incredible. <laughs> Hopefully the transmission's good. This is exactly why, you can't really see, but look at how brown and disgusting that water is. This is exactly why I wanted to run just straight distilled water and then that cooling system cleaner in here for now because that stuff is horribly disgusting and we will be swapping that out multiple times. Turns out our uh, four rib belt here is working fine. <laughs> so I shut it off, but I did manage to find reverse only once. Uh, I'm gonna have to work on that. Also, I gotta double check the transmission fluid level just make sure that we're not running low there. And we're successful, it runs. So I just performed the first oil change after the engine has been warmed up and broken in. No concerns there. Brand new OEM Motorcraft filter going on. And then what we're using now is this Lucas engine break-in oil. It's a straight SAE 30. You can see it's got high zinc content, which is what we want for the bearings to set in and for you know just proper break-in. So we're just gonna use six quarts of this, run that for 50 miles. Then I will dump it and fill it back up with this and a new filter for 500 miles. And then we'll run full synthetic uh, 5W20, I believe is what it calls for. Either 520 or 530 now. I think there's a service bulletin that changes it to 530. But either way, this will be more than sufficient for us to healthily break in our engine. So now that we know this thing runs, let's get the wheels on, get it off jack stands. Let's get this bumper back on and let's go take this thing for a spin. Bumper back on, check. Just missing the little lower valence thing. These tires are in terrible shape, but they will do for now. There we go. First time this truck has been properly on the ground in four months. Woo! Yeah, baby. I'm just gonna kind of test it in the driveway forward and back, make sure I have brakes, forward, you know, drive, reverse, all that good stuff. Well, of course it still runs just fine, but still having a problem uh, getting it to move. And it seems like it's just because the transmission fluid is low. So just let it warm up so that I could properly check it. And then I'm gonna run to the store and get some more ATF fluid. And that should do the trick I'm hoping, unless there's bigger problems, which would certainly not be ideal. Well, I made it to about there and it died. <laughs> I don't know why, there's some fluid right here. What is this? That doesn't appear to be that fresh. Hmm, I don't know. Something about this road and my car's dying on it, but it moves. Hopefully maybe it was just the mass airflow sensor since that's still not totally dialed in. It might've just gotten mad when I accelerated hard. Um, and also, this is not properly tuned for this ECU, so that extra fuel might have just made the engine really upset. She should just fire right back up. 
Yeah, okay. Probably just mass airflow sensor and the exhaust and the tune, like I said. I'm gonna see if I can go a little further. We got ourselves a motherfucking tow rig! Woo! Let's go! Oh my gosh. Months of work, so much blood, sweat, and tears in every possible way, and it's working! Woo! <laughs> oh, man. We gotta do a celebratory burnout over here in the dirt, at least. Oh, man, it, it actually rides pretty good. It's a little, little more, like, clunky than I would want, but I think those are body mounts because everything else is, you know, shocks and bushings and all that stuff up front have been swapped out, so. Also, the tunes work. Yeah, baby, I don't want to turn that on because we'll get copyright struck, but here we go. Yeah, brand new motor, baby, woo! Hell yeah, hell fucking yeah, dude. <laughs> oh, it's time to get rowdy. Let's go. That LSD two wheel peel life, let's go. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, it's so dope. I cannot believe this is working. If you've made it this far in the video, you're a total badass and thank you so much for watching. Now that this truck is running, we can switch gears to some of the other projects I've been neglecting, like the Sonata, and of course we can use this truck to tow our junk to the track. I couldn't be more excited, so stay tuned and I'll see you in the next one.